Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear. This is the Universal Audio uh, UAFX Max. It is a dual compressor pedal that uses Universal Audio's top-notch models of classic compressors. In here we have the 1176, the LA-2A, and even the Humble Dynacomp. Uh, compression can be used in a lot of different ways and a lot of different points in music making, and especially when it's implemented with classic circuits like it is here. There's a lot of things to unpack. There's a lot of things to understand. So I'll start with a really straightforward look at compression, how it works, how you can affect it with controls like this, and then I'll get into specifics of the classic models that are represented here, and then even some specifics of this hardware, what's available to you on the Max. This video is not sponsored, but I did get it for free. I asked UA for it specifically and said I would cover it in exchange for some other gear that I wasn't sure if I would cover, even though it looks like I might cover it now. <laughs> Free advertising, uh, but this video is structured a lot like my Patch Bay video, where I try and make reference to, I need to put this down, <laughs> where I try and make reference to things that are more broadly applicable. So the principles of, in this case, compression, uh, beyond you know what's available to you on the specific hardware I'm using to demonstrate it. So this should stand as a good reference or good education for viewers, whether you're interested in the Macs or not. If you like my style, you like the way I approach things or the way I explain things works for you, here I am explaining compression. So that's it. Uh, if you're subscribed, thanks for coming back. If you're a patron, that means the world to me. If you aren't either, check the links in the description for merch, affiliate links, Patreon, and subscribe while you're down there. That's it. Let's make some noise. Here we are on the table. I have my trusty Yamaha Reface CP. It works great for demonstrating a lot of the principles of compression because it is a sort of more organic sound. Uh, and that's running stereo into the UA Max, which is going stereo into my uh, test cam Model 16. And some of the stuff I'm talking about will be compression very generally. Some of the things I talk about will be idiosyncratic to the compressors that are modeled specifically here in the Max. And some of the stuff I talk about will be specific to the use case. So the sort of instrument you're running it through, or if it's one instrument versus a whole mix, things like that. It's, it's going to all intertwine. I promise it'll make sense as I go through. But first and foremost, let's do sort of basic principles stuff, okay? So I'm going to use just an 1176 model for a lot of the demonstration. I've got a pretty high comp and a pretty high ratio. And output is more or less to level match. Attack and release we'll get to briefly. But the first thing you'll notice... Let's switch this on and off. It's making the quiet bits louder. And the loud bit's quieter. That's what compressors do. They sort of level out your dynamics. The loud things get quieter and the quiet things get louder, right? But how do we really achieve that? The way a lot of compressors are set up, there's something called a threshold, and that threshold is a level. And when a sound goes above that threshold, the circuitry in the compressor will bring that sound down. We don't have anything labeled threshold. We can indirectly control it in the 1176 model uh, because we're changing our input level here. And so, effectively, especially if you account for it then with the output, a louder signal coming in, as modified here, will lower the threshold. Okay, so if I put compression way, way up, and our uh, ratio all the way up, and I play something really quiet without it on, and then I turn it on, you can see this LED is reacting to our playing. Red is the full amount of compression. So playing really, really, really softly with effectively a quite a low threshold from our input gain. And ratio is very, very high. Uh, and to explain ratio before I keep referencing it, <laughs> see our lowest setting here is 4. Uh, with a ratio setting of 4, if something is 4 dB above the threshold, it's attenuated down to 1 dB. Okay, let's do a more generous threshold. So a louder signal has to trigger it like this, but still a really, really high ratio. That's all the way up to 20. So the stuff I play quiet, staying green, we're not reacting at all, right? The stuff I play loud, then that reacts when I play loud. And so then I count on our output there. But we're not changing our quiet stuff too much. See, with a middling or a relatively low threshold, there's a chance the only thing we're affecting are our loudest signals. 
our loudest signals are getting brought down. So if you think of compression in a mixing scenario, in a mixing use case, and you think of mixing fundamentally, you're mixing sound sources in a way that their level, relative levels is working for whatever the creative goal of that song is, or something is less important, so you want it to take less of your attention, so you bring it down. By limiting the dynamic range, it can be easier to keep those things at the point you put them in their mix. Okay, so yes, for mixing, I think the use case is immediately really, really clear. We're limiting the dynamic range of something where I don't want to, over the course of a whole song, you know, automate the volume of things manually. I send it through a compressor, and that compressor is doing a lot of that work for me. Okay, so that is simply what we're doing. Let's talk more about how we can change the way the compressor is responding. And so we have attack and release co controls here. That's common terminology on, on compressors in general. You'll see it on many pieces of software. You'll see it on many pieces of hardware. They both relate to the threshold and how the compressor reacts to a sound that goes over the threshold. So what I'm going to do, I've got drive turned up on the reface. I'm going to introduce the preamp here, which is also modeled, which is so cool. It's just this one knob, but it's a model of the UA610 uh, preamp, another like legendary. I think originally UREI it would have been, but another classic piece of Universal Audio Tech represented here in the Max. But listen to the noise and think of the noise right now, what's going into it almost silence, but I'm bringing it up with the preamp. I'm bringing it up also with what is effectively a very, very low threshold and a very, very high ratio here, okay? So even if I play something soft, listen to the noise. Goes away for a sec when this is at its loudest, okay? And so also watch this LED react. So our most compressed, red, and then medium compression, and then green is low or none. And so what release control does is after we cross our threshold, how quickly do we change from our attenuated level back to uh, the level of our input? So this might be counterproductive for people coming from the synth world, <laughs> but a slower response, a longer release is a low value. So listen to the noise again. So even if I let go right away, see that? We're staying heavily compressed even after that signal is gone. And we can hear that noise slowly coming up. Hopefully this is easy for you to mix in video editing. So how about now we go the opposite extreme? I turn it all the way up. So this will be our fastest uh, response time, our fastest return to un unattenuated. You can see it visually here. We get out of that red almost immediately. And hopefully you can hear it with the noise coming in. Almost as soon as I release the keys, that noise jumps right back up to where it was. Attack, in principle, is doing the same thing on the beginning of our sound instead of the end. So after we've crossed our threshold, how quickly do we attenuate that signal? So a little bit of your transient can get through with a relatively slow attack. It's very, very hard to demonstrate that on an 1176 because it's extremely fast. It's in microseconds. I can feel differences when I play on bass, when I play on guitar, and sometimes especially you can hear the transient making it through. If I turn this all the way clockwise, that's our slowest response. And even with our highest ratio and a dramatic comp, I'll talk about all in a second, I promise. It's very, very hard for me to notice that. So if I turn it way slow, it should be our fastest response. I, I can sort of get a little bit extra transient. It's really, really difficult to, to explain. It's very, very subtle. I'm not, I'm not even going to try and find. On stringed instruments, I can really feel the difference, especially if you're listening closely just to yourself and you're not in full mix. Compressors in other applications, software for video editing, for example, your attack time is a lot, lot longer. So the attack and release are not on the same scale, not on the same time scale, even, even close. <laughs> the fastest, I'll put them on screen, I don't know exactly what they are, but our slowest attack and our slowest release are in microseconds, and it's like 1.1 seconds on release. So they're, they're completely different time scales. This ends up being more about feel because it's on such a tight time scale, and release is more about how, how smoothly your sort of uh, volume changes or your compressor squishes, as people say, uh, over time. Cool. <laughs> That's sort of like as far as controls we have that relate to uh, compression fundamentally. That's what these gray knobs are all about, these five gray knobs. Compression in general, those principles will mean something. Those principles will matter. Those principles will be applicable to understanding what you're hearing with any compressor that you're using. 
There's also a lot of idiosyncratic things that happen in the Max. And a lot of when people talk about character compression, I think Max is great for that because it's emulating three classic compressors. I've used the 1176 this whole time. And one of the things on the 1176, uh, the original ratio selection is four different push buttons. And normally picking one will unselect the others. If you're on 12, you can't push in eight. You know what I mean? The buttons won't pop up. There is a way such and such, you know, studio and such and such <laughs> engineer discovered if you push in all four knobs at the same time, you can get it to uh, have some sort of unique behaviors. So all here is not uh, an infinite ratio. All here is emulating the specific behavior of an 1176 when you get all four of those buttons in at the same time. And, and it does some things that are a little unpredictable. It changes the way attack and release respond. It's something I can really notice. What all exactly is it doing? I'm not sure. I just know that's a sort of idiosyncratic, like, vintage hardware thing that is available on this modern piece of hardware, which I think is really, really cool. It sort of gets you the idea of, of what's being accomplished in this pedal. We have models of vintage gear and the behavior and the controls you have access to. And a, and a great example of that, so if I switch down now to the LA-2A, so we were on the uh, URI or, or UA 1176, now we're on Teletronics LA-2A. And LA-2A, it says FET for the 1176 and Opto here for the LA-2A, the way the 1176 work is transistors as variable resistors. Uh, here in the LA-2A, it's it's an optical cell. There's a light bulb or, or something that generates light and then a light-dependent resistor. And we're using that to define our envelope. And that sort of defines a lot of the behavior um, of this unit, or in this case, the, the modeling of this unit. Included in this model is the lack of certain controls. So attack doesn't do anything on the LA-2A because the LA-2A doesn't have an attack control. Release does something. You can see the pedal telling you uh, that that's not a control that does anything because it's flashing. If you go all the way to all on ratio here, it's just the 20 to 1 setting. It's just the highest setting. And I'm actually going to look at the manual really quick because I don't think compression on the LA-2A is just uh, the input amount. Controls the level of input gain and compression. I don't know if that's saying it's, it's a macro uh, but we get more compression, more character as we turn it up. So let's listen at relatively similar settings to this 1176. And the LA-2A. Even at really, really dramatic settings. This feels, it's such a dumb word, it feels gummier. <laughs> yeah, I, I could use dumb little words to tell you over and over what I what I think they sound like, but it, does, it doesn't matter. Just know that they're different. And what's so nice about having them on a single switch in, uh, you know, a modeled piece of hardware like this, I could just try them both. I can just flip between them. And, and even if I don't know, you know, the history of, of what it was used on and what it was good for, this is great for vocals, this is good for guitar, this is good for drums, it doesn't matter. And that shouldn't matter to you, really. You can just try them both. And in your specific application, which which is working better for you and which settings are working for you, that's part of what's so cool about having this in hardware and it being modeled. Because you have all this provenance of these like classic, classic pieces of gear and, and they have lasted over time because they sound good, but you don't need to know the situations in which they have sounded good before. Just know that you can check really, really easily <laughs> and see which one works for you here. I really, really love that. Uh, just because I'm talking about it so much now, let's also show you the Dynacomp. So the Dynacomp is a classic guitar pedal. I had one on my board for years. It has two controls, sensitivity and output level. And if you look, as I turn any of these three controls, it tells me with that flashing LED that they're not changing anything for this Dynacomp. So we also have modeled a Dynacomp, which is a much less expensive, much less high fidelity, simpler circuit as a stomp box in the, I believe it would have been the seventies. So it is this other example of classic historically relevant compression. And it, that sort of that pop on the transient is what I remember from guitar. So it's a lower fidelity squish. And it 
has less control because the original hardware had less control. I also feel like there's a little bit of filtering going on there, some EQ changing. Love that. I'm going to drive it really, really hard with the preamp just to hear it. Yeah, I hope you can notice that. There's really a pop. Actually, this might be a good example. Uh, so that pop is, you can think of that as the sort of result of an attack control. So that pop, the attack on the Dynacop, is the original transient making it through, and then it takes a little bit of time for it to react and bring it right, right down. So, so cool. So you get that really, really sharp. That's what I remember liking uh, about guitar. I could really get that first thing to hit. And just the way it feels when you play, it responds in a different way. Uh, but seems like such a strange pairing to these other two, if you think of it as, oh, these are two high-quality, expensive, very configurable classic circuits, you know, to, to pair those with the Dynacomp, something something cheap and in a lot of ways less capable, quote-unquote, than the other two. But it, it really is another classic historically relevant circuit. And so, again, you might be using this compressor in an application, and it turns out that the Dynacomp is the one that feels and sounds the best. And instead of, you know, having to go through all the trouble of having the real hardware and trying them all for whatever application, you can just flip the switch. I think that's delightful. So that was, again, like I told you, all these things intertwined. That was talk about using this for character compression with these three classic circuits. That was talk about what's cool about the Mac specifically. It's really hard to unravel these things. <laughs> so I think I've done a decent enough job. That's how I would explain compression to somebody who asked me. And, and, and when we're bleeding more into sort of specifics about how the Max works and what I like about the Max. So we'll head there. I, I mentioned the preamp a couple times, but that should not be understated. It, I, and I ca said so many times, we just have, you know, historically relevant, iconic circuits modeled here. The preamp is that same thing. It is a classic circuit represented here uh, in, in hardware in a way that we can use it. I find that it's very, very reactive to line level signals. I'm going to bring the volume down on the reface so I'm not driving it so hard. And if I want to hear just the preamp and sort of the color of the circuit, we'll go back down to the 1176. If I put ratio to off, I'm not compressing anything at all. I'm still modeling the hardware, and right now I'm using it just to hear the preamp on its own. So even if it's just one knob, there's a lot you can get out of the preamp here. Uh, and it might be the thing that really sells your sound. So I'm, again, like I said, attenuating the volume here on the, on the reface. <laughs> sort of rumbling uh, drive there. There's nothing. Our output does still affect our signal, even with our, our compression at zero. And why don't I try? Push all the way in the hard clipping with the preamp. I think uh, electric piano sounds aren't the best to demonstrate what can happen with the preamp. I'll, I'll give you some examples with drums later. But back to, more generally, what you get from the Max, the sort of features of this as a piece of hardware on its own. I've been using a single compressor the whole time, but there are two in, in the pedal. There are two fully separate, independent, independently controllable compressors. And this switch in the middle lets you control compressor one or compressor two. So if I put compressor two on the Dynacomp and I try and change these knobs, you can see it reacting. If I go back to compressor one while we're on the 11 to 76, all these work fine. So they're totally separate. The way they're routed, you control with, ta-da, <laughs> the UAFX app, which I'm screen recording and I'll, I'll bring that up now. You can control the way they're routed in a bunch of different ways. You can have one to the other and really, really squash whatever it is you're working with. You could have them in parallel and then mixed. And in this case, they're still both stereo. And actually, I should just highlight that. All this stuff is modeled, but the, all this stuff is modeled in stereo, even if original hardware is gonna be mono. If I put a really dramatic stereo pan here. Totally like, <laughs> kind of a crazy feature if you, if you think about the scale of it. And that's true for all of them. The Dynacomp even, which was never a stereo thing modeled in stereo. Wonderful. That was totally an offshoot, but uh, but with two compressors on, you can run them in series, you can run them in parallel, you can run them exclusive, and exclusive is you tap the foot switches to swap between them, which is very, very cool, or 
uh, my favorite edition, and I don't think this was in their release, split. So instead of each being modeled in stereo, you know, on its own, you're modeling two separate mono compressors. So you could use this on two separate sound sources. I think that's crazy, crazy useful. I'm going to leave it in series for now. Uh, but this is kind of my, my biggest complaint. I hate that I have to pull my phone out and connect with Bluetooth to change settings that this fundamentally changes the way the pedal reacts. If we're talking specifically here in the Max, is it likely that I would need to change this on the fly? No. I, I think for compression, chances are you're going to settle on one of these foot switch modes and leave it there a lot of the time. I, I can see some experimentation between serial and parallel, but you, you understand what I'm saying. Chances are the foot switch mode is something you'll set and leave on 80% of the time. Sidechain bass filter, I'll just, I'll just verbally explain. It takes low end out of the control signal. So your compressor, so the compressor will react less to low end, but the same audio still makes it through. So if you have something with huge low end, you don't want it to pump so dramatically, you can take that out. You can take that low end out of the control signal. And we have for compressor two, uh, of course, the same controls on each. That's it. It's not presets for the max. Um, that, that's it. It's not presets for the max. It's not much else. Most of the functionality is available on the panel. And I'll use this, I think I did the exact same thing in the Delverb video. Uh, what I would really, really love, and the Max is even a better use case for it, is MIDI over the USB-C jack that's on here. Because then I wouldn't have to swap between compressors 102 if it was if we were so lucky as the MIDI implementation to include uh, MIDI CC control over all the parameters. I wouldn't have to swap between compressor 1 and 2 and potentially... Uh, end up with a really jarring settings change. So because you're using the same, because the knobs are shared, they'll jump to whatever position they're at. So if I have both on and compressor 2 is really high compression and compressor 1 is really low compression, if I am now on compressor 1 and I just barely bump that compression knob, I've suddenly jumped from a low value to a really, really high one. That can really be a big difference. If this was MIDI compatible, fully MIDI CC compatible, I could use some small MIDI controller or knobs on a bigger piece of hardware like my MPC to control everything for compressor 2, and, and I have a separate set of knobs, and I don't have to worry about it. That is also mitigated because compression is, in a lot of cases, set it and forget it, and you're not going to actively be changing your level of compression because it'll have such a big result on your uh, levels coming out that chances are, <laughs> if you're using this in, in split or exclusive, if you're using both compressors, you would have had it all set up to go already. So all sorts of intertwining complaints there. I'm actually going to turn off the screen recording now. So all sorts of intertwining comments about the sort of uh, technological, so to speak, side of the Max. I guess I don't know why there aren't presets um, now that I say that in, in the app for this. It, it, it seems like the perfect example for that. Regardless, I guess that's more of the hardware experience. <laughs> you got to set the knobs every time you turn it on. That, that was so much, and it was so much sort of, I don't want to say theory, but so much about how this works and what it can do. And for some people, I know you'd much rather see a demonstration of, of some of the sort of setups you can achieve um, with something so flexible. Two compressors and two preamps and, and routing and configuring and switching, all sorts of options. So I'm going to show you a few specific setups that take advantage of the Max in different ways. Jump scare. I've got a drum machine. This is my Oberheim DX with the stretch attachment. There's so many things when you're working with drums or a rhythmic element, I guess at all, with a compressor, uh, where the behavior changes and the way you need to approach it is different. So I think it makes the most sense for me to put this after everything I've already told you, because it requires a sort of understanding of what we're doing. I'm, I'm gonna be connecting a lot of different systems, but I think I most likely will be using this compressor for rhythmic elements, or you know, I'll run a whole group box through it, or just a drum machine, because compression matters so, so much for drums to sound complete and together. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about compression on a drum machine here. So first and foremost, like a lot of things I've shown you today, starting with something dramatic so you can hear what's happening is, is mostly for demonstration purposes and realistically pulling everything a little bit more subtle is more of a more of a real world scenario. But if I make everything really dramatic, and to be honest, I like really, really heavily compressed drums. But the first thing I want to show you is watch the way this is reacting and listen to what you're hearing. You can hear a huge, huge, huge difference between a slow release and a fast release when you have rhythmic elements like this. So right now, with a slow release, even without the kick, we're never getting a chance 
for our level of attenuation to sort of calm down again. Every time we get below the threshold, or would be below the threshold, our release is so slow, we're not changing. So I can see right now we're going between the highest and the middle levels of compression with release, but ignore that and listen. So there's a slow release, kind of flat, right? We're never getting a chance to drop below our threshold again. But if I have really, really fast release, you can hear the difference. It gets even more dramatic when I introduce something as, as boomy as the kick here. And gets more dramatic again when I introduce the preamp. If I make release as fast as I can, I take the preamp out again, and I sort of feather this threshold. Hey, it's our input gain technically, but I want to find a spot that has an amount of movement that works for what I'm trying to accomplish. So I really want to hear the compressor moving. I give it a fast enough release that I can hear it moving. If I want the transients to come through, I give it a slow enough tech that the transients make it through. Okay. So there's the first like big consideration uh, with using a drum machine. Great. You can kind of you get a slightly better understanding of what's happening with all the all setting on the 1176 with drums. I'm noticing, especially if you really crank them. Uh, is this a good? Maybe this works. Just heavy compression. The all setting. That's great, and you can hear some of the that pumping, like a really obvious pumping. I, I should have one more example where you can really hear that. Uh, I am going to go back into the app really quick here. UAFX control. I'm not going to do a screen recording again. It's really tough for me to sync those up. <laughs> and I'm going to have plenty of settings to change. But our low and high EQ on the preamp. Pretty noticeable here. And this is a much better example for the sidechain bass filter. So once I turn the sidechain bass filter on, the low end is taken out of the control signal for the max. So the max is reacting to the input sound as if there was less low end, but your low end is still in the audio path. It's still passing and getting compressed. It's still passing and getting compressed all the same. It's just controlling. It's making the compressor react less to low end. So this, yeah, this is a decent enough example. So I just have a hi-hat right now, bring the kick in. So without it on, listen to how much that that hi-hat is reacting. Now it's reacting so much less, even so much so that the hi-hat is enough to really make our compressor react here. With the release time set where it's at, we hear it, the transient of every single one of those, pulling the compressor down. Now with it off, that low end is contributing the level you would expect, the amount you would expect, to the control signal. And we're getting the hi-hats pushed way, way down because of it. Uh, I where for these examples, I prefer the sounds with it off, but that as a sort of configuring option is really, really slick. Great, and I just like really compressed drum machine sounds. And great opportunity to use both compressors here and really both preamps. So I want to see this reacting. I want to see movement from it. I want to see the character. I want to evidence that what I'm doing is having an effect here. The preamp. So right now it's preamp compressor, preamp compressor. All serial. Sounds completely different, right? <laughs> and if I pull my, pull my phone away, but if I pull back out here, this is a good chance to use a parallel compression. Hear how different that is? Because we're not stacking the gain. We're not driving these things nearly as hard as we were. So to get a similar sort of reaction, a similar sort of compression, 
I got to turn up the input on both. And remember now, in parallel, both are in stereo, and they're getting mixed together in stereo again. <laughs> you can hear my phone <laughs> with the DX. But that sounds so much different than running in stereo. And it makes sense if you think about it. It's a compressor and a preamp and a compressor and a preamp all through each other. There's gain, there's character, there's distortion. Actually, am I still in stereo? I, I gotta leave this up here. In serial, holy shit. <laughs> if I control compressor one and I push the output way up, that's just driving the next preamp and the next compressor even harder. So you can really... There is, of course, something I haven't mentioned at all that you're probably really scratching your heads about. <laughs> a classic application of compressors in electronic music is sidechain. And for that, I've set up my Roland TR-8 and my Juno 106. I currently have something very simple on the TR-8 and something kind of simple, pretty classic on the Juno. And, and when people say sidechaining, they really mean the pumping of a compressor. Sidechain literally is the control signal isn't running through the compressor. Sidechain, that word, means you're controlling the compressor with something else. But when people say it, especially in electronic music, they mean a compressor dropping, especially with a kick drum. Okay? So if I have the TR-8 running, okay, and right now I have the 106 going through the TR-8, it has like a mix in jack. So I control its level here. Uh, but think of it like they're going through a separate mixer and then they're coming into the max, okay? And I've got these really, really dramatic settings. Uh, we're on the 1176 again. And if I can barely hear it because I need to turn down the level of the Juno. So the control signal, so to speak, that low end from the TR-8 here is enough to push it down. And you can hear it now. And let's turn it off, actually. That's how quiet the Juno is. That's how loud the TR-8 is. But with the compressor on, they kind of level out. And that's doing what I want it to do, but the setup is so impractical with them mixed together on the way in. So what I would do if I was trying to see side chain, first and foremost, the TR-8 is a, a terrible example for this because it has a simple variable side chain already built into that same mix in jack. So I can set it up, no problem. But if I don't have a, a drum machine or, or mixer implemented in a way that lets me do that, and I'm just trying to complete with the max, I would do another, I would do a different trick. This is something I think is pretty silly. But I'm still running it in the same configuration, okay? Serial, but we're gonna run the Juno in mono into the left channel and the TR-8 in mono into the right channel. Give me a second. So I'm still running this in serial, right? It's still just one compressor and I'm still only gonna use one. But on one side, I think it'll be the right, is the TR-8, and on the left side, it'll be my Juno. And that's what it sounds like before I change the panning and all, but of course, because stereo is just two separate signals, right? I'm just treating them as a linked stereo pair so that they're reacting to the same inputs. But then with the magic of video editing, <laughs> I'm panning what was the left and the right now, both down the middle. I don't need to treat this left and right as left and right. After it's out of the max, they're separate signals and I can do whatever I need to do with them. And so, I've got the Juno reacting more in line with what I'd like it to be doing. In terms of the side chain, I can bring it up in post. I can bring it up at the mixer. I can bring it up after the max. I, that might be a bad example. It might be impractical. If I was really going for side chain, like really, really dramatic 
you know, pumping, pumping side chain. I, I might not use the Max, and if I was using the Max, I don't know that I necessarily would, but if I was, it'd be a live scenario where it just makes sense to have one compressor and a whole mix running through it, and, and I would be using this in such a way that it's always on, because you'd need to have your kick drum so much louder that control signal, so to speak. You need to have that kick drum so much louder than everything else to get the pump to react the way you want, and all the other settings would need to be so dramatic. I don't know that I'd rely on this for that really, really obvious sidechain thing. I'd look to, um, you know, there's pedals like the Pill, which all they do is sidechain. Uh, or I'd get a compressor that specifically has a sidechain input and, and not try and set up something janky. I, I'd get hardware that was a better fit for that scenario or had controls that made it easier for me to get to that. Like, for example, honestly, the TR-8 having this sidechain knob for the external input. Is there anything else I want to show with this setup? After doing that sidechain example, I, I'm thinking of a few other sort of clever ways to like manipulate the routing on this, but I feel like I'm getting a little bit in the weeds and I think I'm gonna cut it off. Uh, I will say, the thing I thought of, parallel compression doesn't have to be two compressors side by side. You can have a relatively clean sound on one, uh, or relatively dry, relatively unaffected sound on one, and the other one very, very compressed. That's what I'm used to with uh, my favorite guitar compressor, the Keeley compressor, and as a dry blend. It's sort of thinking of it like that, parallel compression isn't always two compressors, it's a non-affected signal with a compressed one. And and that might be as simple as the feel of your sustain lasting longer, your sustain lasting longer undistorted. And I should say, I didn't show you split at all, but I think you can understand, oh, this can be two totally separate signal paths for two motto inputs. It could be drums, it could be two separate drums from mix outputs, it could be one guitar and a bass, even if you were sharing a board with somebody else. Like there's so much potential flexibility that I'm worried that I, I'm worried I'm at the point where I'm just listing off things you might be able to do with this. And, and I suspect anybody who needs any of the complicated or non-specific stuff would have thought of that idea for themselves already. I hope that I will have done a good enough job explaining the way you interact with this and what it can do that you can see some potential setups for yourself by now. So I think I'm going to end it here. I, I like a lot about the Max. I like having access uh, in a pedal to modeling that I would normally associate just with being in a VST. I, I work primarily in hardware. There's a lot of reasons why this is better for working live, having a pedal like this, and maybe even you're used to having access to those VSTs, uh, and you're used to these controls and these ranges and these sounds, and having it in hardware for a live show is, is perfect for you. I love that scenario. It's great. I'm really happy to have it. I expect to use it on drums a lot of the time. UA, uh, I think you're doing a great job with pedals. That's all I got. My name's Jorb. I love gear. It really includes the UA Max. Thanks for watching. Cheers and so long.